This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Roja Shy. Hello, this is Roja, and this is a special series of uh, Musings of the Shy's episodes dealing with Silk Road. I have um, re uploaded the first trilogy uh, discussing Silk Road, um, along with a new episode giving you the update. And then we're following up another series of shows that will deal with some of the ramifications. Um, one is Agents of Silk Road, which deal with the, the FBI and Secret Service and possibly another federal agent involved in the corruption of the Silk Road case. A deal to look at uh, decentralized marketplaces that have cropped up since the collapse of Silk Road, both on the dark web and on the clear web, if you will. Uh, fungibility, dealing with the issue of the ramifications of coins that have been, may have been utilized in the dark web or illicit sites, uh, whether it be ga- game, gambling, porn, or uh, the drug buys, primarily drug buys, uh, what that means for cryptocurrencies in general, but in particular with the blockchain spies for Bitcoin. And then the rise of privacy cash as a result of the collapse of not only Silk Road, uh, the de anonymization of Tor, uh, the fact that there are these blockchain uh, spies um, on the blockchain, they're, they're tracking the, all the various different types of purchases people are making, but who's also actually making those purchase, uh, purchases. And that will culminate um, basically the next two weeks of the Musings of the Shy episodes, centering on the theme of, of Silk Road, fungibility of cryptocurrency, in the rise of decentralized marketplaces. Now on to the show. And my name is Hero Job Shibe, and this is Musings of a Shy Podcast, a Dogecoin peer to peer sharing economy show. And you are listening to this episode 20. Hello, McFly. Hello. McFly! On this episode uh, is going to be the completion of the trilogy on the Silk Road Ross Ulrich trial. Uh, this episode, I'm just going to lay out my thoughts on the impact of the Ross Ulrich charges, my thoughts on the federal government going after him, uh, the impact overall that this case is having on the internet and freedom. But before we get into the episode, the news. <laughs> the news. Our Millionaire Maker is having some issues with PayPal. If you're unfamiliar with Our Millionaire Maker, it is a subreddit on the Reddit forums that was born on the out of an idea a couple months ago, right before Christmas, out of the subreddit forum, Our Shower Thoughts. And what happened was that this Redditor posted on this forum stating that there's over a million individuals who use Reddit. If each of those Redditors were to give $1 to a single Redditor, someone that was chosen, you could instantly make an individual millionaire. And thus, our Millionaire Makers was born. This subreddit seeks to gather donations from Redditors at $1 at a time through the use of either PayPal, Bitcoin, or Dogecoin to, in essence, make one Redditor a millionaire. A millionaire. Uh, the first time they did it, when they chose it, uh, they were able to raise up to to like less than a thousand dollars and there you can still give if you want to a dollar to that winner uh the second winner was given uh almost a little bit over uh eleven thousand dollars and you can still give to that individual and then the currently right now uh, the third winner has uh three thousand seven hundred forty three dollars has been given to them in essence what they're basically asking is if you use a paypal uh, account you can give you have to give a little bit over a dollar dollar forty because of the fees associated it with it, but it, the USD equivalent in Bitcoin and Dogecoin, and thus give to this individual um, this money, and then that individual comes back on the forum and pretty much breaks down what they did, like what they spent it on, uh, what bills they paid, what gifts they done, anything of that nature, to kind of humanize the whole process. Uh, but what has happened is that there's been an issue with PayPal. There was an issue for the first time and the second time they've done this, and there's been a really significant issue this time around, where PayPal has basically rejected that individual's PayPal account and forced them to 
to um, send their donations back to anyone who gave through PayPal. And what has happened is that our millimaker is putting a post detailing the breakdown of how you can use PayPal to purchase cryptocurrencies and give that cryptocurrency to the individual and um, a simple one, two, three, four, five step process. And uh, it's a very simple process. Um, it's, I have a link in the show notes. I'm just going to read a little bit from the post. So basically, if you already have a PayPal account, all you have to do is download, uh, and this is a, they use the example of Dogecoin, an Android Dogecoin wallet or an iOS Dogecoin wallet. Uh, step two, let the wallet sync up and do its thing. So basically, let the program run until it's fully activated. And then you're going to receive the Dogecoin wallet address, which is a, a string of numbers and, and letters. During the step two process, go to we sell Doge, doges.com to email support at uh, we sell crypto.com about raising your limit. Just ver- verification to make sure you're a real person and email your PayPal ID email. And uh, when you receive the response from we sell Doge, doge.com, which is part of step four, go back and send $5 to your phone wallet, the long string of numbers from before. From the phone wallet, send 7,000 Dogecoin to you small rye, which is the current winner of this uh, third time drawing. And 7,000 Dogecoin is equal to uh, $1 in USD uh, to his Dogecoin ar- address. And you're done. Uh, you don't need to connect your bank account or anything like that. It's quick, easy, and painless. And if you want to, you can go to Arch Dogecoin and join the subreddit. And if you need any assistance, there's more than anybody willing to help you to do that. So basically, it's just a breakdown on how you can purchase Dogecoin through um, the use of PayPal and give it to the individual. Um, if you are a Dogecoin member or a Bitcoin member, I highly encourage you to give one dollar either through t- change tip, uh, in, uh, straight out of your you know Coinbase or Bit, Bit wallet of any type, and just give to this uh, Million Maker Fund for the sole purpose of just demonstrating to individuals out there that it's very easy to give money and you don't have to worry about it being frozen or being denied or being rejected or fitting some kind of type of criteria, as in the case with the PayPal account. In other news, Braintree, which is a subsidiary of PayPal, has opened their merchant service the use of Bitcoin out of, into beta. So it's opened and expanded uh, the ability of merchants within their, their system to use Bitcoin. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Braintree, Braintree is just another merchant service provider. It, it's a software and just a payment platform provider out there in the world for businesses to accept credit cards and debit cards card transactions. And then last year it began to accept uh, Bitcoin has now moved into beta where now it's expanded the, the possibilities of merchants. If they choose to, they can accept Bitcoin through that, through that, through the Braintree payment system. And this opens a great possibility because Uber and Airbnb, uh, Hotel Tonight, and a lot of other very popular, uh, trendy, uh, peer-to-peer uh, services and, and tech companies out there ex- use Braintree as their payment provider. So that means it's possible and a much sooner chance for Bitcoin to have more merchants accepting for payments and goods and services in Bitcoin. And then kit.com, kim.com, not kit, but kim.com has launched a program which is in beta right now called Mega Chat. It is a browser-based encrypted video calling and following share platform. Basically, they seek to compete against Drop Dropbox and Skype. Primarily, his focus is on against competing against Skype. Basically, it's a browser enabled um, software program that allows you to chat just like with Skype uh, through this browser program, but you do not have to worry about uh, the government or anybody listening on your calls, which uh, this is something that the Snowden uh, leaks has demonstrated that that's what the NSA has been doing, is that they're capable of eavesdropping on both ends of Skype, but most importantly, they've been keeping all that information of those Skype calls, whether they are relevant to any particular case or not. This is not possible with um, Mega Chat. Um, uh, Kim Dot com is basically stating that they use a user controlled encryption program, which means that you have to have the ability to decrypt uh, on both ends in order to listen in on the phone call. And then in other news, Barrett Brown is a journalist, has been sentenced today to five years in federal prison. This is a, a result of the Stratford Global Intelligence hack. Stratford Global was hacked by Anonymous. Uh, there's already been other members that have been sentenced because of this hack, and Stratford Global is affiliated with the NSA and the U.S. government in general. And what happened was as a result of the various Snowden and WikiLeaks, uh, Stratford Global was targeted by Anonymous and they were able to breach their 
files and systems and leak their database out into the internet. And what happened was that Barrett Brown, a journalist, um, was given access or had access to the to the um, database. And what he did was he shared it. He link shared it so indiv- other individuals would be able to access the, the material themselves and view and look at all the data that is available in there. And a lot of the stuff that has come out of the Stratford Global Intelligence Hack is basically just reconfirming uh, the Snowden leaks and the WikiLeaks about the NSA listening on to people's calls, uh, the treatment of Iraqi prisoners, um, just a little more, a number of different um, scandals concerning the U.S. government and its actions on the war on terror, and particularly just overall its over surveillance, over surveillance of individuals. Uh, basically, he's facing five years in prison for sharing the link and being very aggressive in sharing the link, just going beyond, um, not just beyond, going on beyond just writing articles and posting a link to it, but just being very aggressive and sharing where you, anyone could attain attain that information. He was also he was he had event, he was eventually when he was first charged he could have faced up to 105 years in prison, but a lot of charges were dropped. Um, a lot of stuff went away, and he's pretty much just being such as right now for five years in prison. Okay, and that's it for the news. Before we get on to the episode, the term of the episode. Peer-to-peer, or P2P, is something I've spoken about on this show, and I'm just going to break down the term. Peer-to-peer, peers are the computer systems which are connected to each each other via via the internet. So files can be shared directly between systems on a network without the need of a central server. In other words, each computer on a P2P network becomes a file server as well as a client. So this term comes from tech terms. So for example, in the early days, you had a Kazaa, LimeWire, BearShare, Morpheus. These were peer-to-peer software programs. Napster, which utilizes the principles of peer-to-peer, but it had a central server. Because I, LimeWire, LimeWire, BearShare, and Morpheus did not. And basically, the the only requirements for anyone to join a peer-to-peer network is for a computer and an internet connection. And that's why these software programs work. Uh, You also have, you know, Nuntal, BitTorrent, is another peer-to-peer type of system. Cryptocurrencies are a peer-to-peer type of system. All you have to do is have a computer, the ability to download the software program for any cryptocurrency, and you're part of the network. That's it. There's no central server. There's nobody controlling the program because it's open source. That's it to join the network. And that's what it means to be peer-to-peer. And to continue with the tech terms definition, um, once connected to the network, the peer-to-peer software allows you to share the files on, on other people's computers. Meanwhile, other users on the network can share, can search for files on your computer, but typically only within a single folder that you have designated to share. So for example, with LimeWire, if you were to upload the latest blah, blah, blah band, uh, you would designate within the LimeWire or Kazaa or BearShare program that blah, blah, blah uh, is available for sharing. That's how those type of software programs work. Uh, With cryptocurrency, it is the wallet that is the program that you're sharing. And even though you're sharing your your information in the sense that you're act, an active user, no one can actually directly connect to your wallet because they don't have your uh, private keys. But once you've activated your private keys within your own wallet and decided to send it to another individual, that individual, whomever you send it to, whether it's for a payment for goods and services or a friend, you just want to send them some money. Uh, once they activate their wallet and go into their wallet and look and to see their received funds, they can then obtain those coins. So basically, while peer-to-peer network makes file sharing easy and convenient, it can also lead to a lot of software piracy and legal music downloads. So basically, you know, this is the system upon which a lot of torrent uh, sites use is the peer-to-peer network. Now, in in, in another application of P2P or peer-to-peer, Uber is a peer-to-peer company because Uber, their software is the app. And that app program connects the individual with a driver. Now, on Uber, since while it's not a complete peer, peer to peer, what Uber does is it filters the drivers, you know, it verifies that the driver is, you know, licensed, they ensure they operate in the company in that sense. And as far as on the individual end, they make sure that a customer does pay for the ride. That there's no chargebacks, there is no skipping out on the fare. So on their end, they just verify that information is occurring. But the app program itself connects people. Uber doesn't block people from getting an Uber ride. Uh, it doesn't state or designate a time. It basically, you, you, do, you load up the app on your phone, you signal that you want a driver 
where you're going and then a driver comes to you. A driver who is an, you know, a client of Uber sees that all these different fares are in his area, picks that fare and connects to you. So it's still a very, in essence, a peer to peer in the sense that there is no centralized server, but there is still a centralized mechanism in the sense that Uber, you know, verifies the driver and verifies the payments as far as the the individual paying for the service. So in essence, what peer-to-peer is, is a lack of a centralized server. You only need the download the software program to join the network and have a computer device, whether it be a mobile device or a PC or a laptop. So that's what peer-to-peer means. My charity shout outs go to Doge for Books. Doge for Books is a is an effort to raise funds to give books to children in India. Doge for Books. There will be a link in the show notes. Uh, Doge for Robots is still going on. There has been an update on Doge for Robots where you can go to our Dogecoin and see a demonstration of 524 uh, Boss Bots, Randy's team, demonstrating their robot on a YouTube channel. Uh, Doge for Esports is seeking uh, additional sponsors for the upcoming Spring League of 2015. You can check out on the link in the show notes and see if it, if you have a cryptocurrency business or if you as an individual want to sponsor the upcoming Spring League, you can contact them. And then Africa to the Moon is still going on strong. Uh, there is an official link on the Africa to the Moon website where you can donate Dogecoin uh, to to that cause. And then if you are interested and you want to support Ross Ulbrich's defense fund, there is a link in the show notes to the free Ross site. So what does the Ross Ulbrich and the Silk Road trial mean in the case in itself? There's a couple things that are going on. Uh, first off, just referring back to the timeline that I spoke to spoke about in the previous episode, Silk Road only existed for about two years and some change. And within six months of its existence, the federal government was already attempting to infiltrate Silk Road and place it undercover agents doing drug buys, uh, trying to place informants within the Silk Road organization from the get-go, building a case to take down whomever operated Silk Road. To me, that seems quite unprecedented in the sense of the response by the federal government. And really, the amount of effort in the investigation that went into Silk Road, I mean, there's an apple alphabetic soup of agencies that were investigating Silk Road from Homeland Security, DEA, NSA. I mean, it was all over the place. Department of Justice in and of itself, not even even just the, the sub-branches that the Department of Justice oversees. And really, it goes back to what I spoke about in the first uh, episode, how Silk Road pretty much demonstrated the fear that the federal government has had for some time about the eBay of the drug market. It successfully had done so. Within the first two years of its existence, its entire existence is responsible for, according to the federal government, $1.2 billion in drug transactions. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the drug laws uh, of this nation and other nations, they, the laws do exist. And the selling of illegal nar- narcotics is, is, a, is in of itself a crime. But the force upon which they went after Silk Road is very disturbing and distressing, particularly given the fact that a number of states and even at the federal level are reviewing the nature of their drug laws. I mean, marijuana across a number of states has been decriminalized and in many instances are just outright you can now smoke marijuana like in Colorado and Washington. Um, there's efforts to reduce the sentencing levels that are attributed to uh, drug convictions, particularly here in the state of California they have where you can go to a rehab facility instead of going to prison uh, if you're caught with possession of drugs. And if you look at the individuals or the type of organizations that support the current drug laws is typically law enforcement agencies who primarily benefit economically from the existing drug laws. Um, just look at the case, the fact that this year alone, um, Eric Holder, the attorney general, has suspended the program, which enabled and allowed local and state law enforcement agencies to seize individuals' assets, uh, property, whether it be cash, uh, homes, any type of property regardless of whether or not they have been charged with a drug crime or be, have been convicted of a drug crime, a drug crime, they can be seized of drug they were if that individual or individuals were in possession of a certain level of narcotics, so that cash, that property could be seized. And that program right now is currently suspended on the 
the state and local level, law enforcement level. It's not suspended on the federal level, from my understanding, it is currently under review, but it's still being used. So there's a lot of monetary value. There's a lot of political clout associated with the enforcement of drugs. And so when something kind of tips that system, when an individual such as Ross Ulbrich demonstrated that he could eBay the drug market and that it becomes an increasingly difficult for law enforcement to track and prevent the drug trade from occurring, you can understand why they might do a bit of an overkill or overcharge on any individual who does this. And all you have to do is look at what has happened since Silk Road uh, was developed and then since it since Ross Ulbrich has been charged. There's been a number of different dark markets or drug markets that have flourished since the, the collapse of the original Silk Road. And even though uh, Silk Road 2.0, uh, the the individuals responsible for that creation have been caught. There's still a number of different drug markets out there that has not been um, found. So really what the the Ross Ulbrich and the various charges that he's facing has demonstrated is that the federal government wants to strike a fear into the drug trade where if you try or attempt to eBay the drug market, they're they're throwing the book at you. Whether or not you are directly involved, tangentially involved, they're coming after anyone associated with with those type of drug, drug drug markets. The second thing that's disturbing about this case is the nature upon which they were able to find Silk Road in of itself. That has come to in, into question. Yes, the federal government did place undercover agents to go on to the Silk Road marketplace and make purchases of drugs and try to use the, the human assets of ingratiating themselves with individuals and vendors associated with the Silk Road market. But the fact that they were able to seize the different servers associated with the Silk Road market has been come to come into question. In particular, the fact with the revelations under the the Snowden, Snowden leaks about the extent upon which uh, law enforcement and the U.S. government has done backdoors to different uh, software programs. That the fact that they don't actively seek out warrants or subpoenas to find information and that they literally just go out and hack and penetrate different types of uh, programs willy-nilly in the course of their war on terror or their law enforcement investigations. And so if a legal precedent is set with this case with Ross Ulbrich, it basically means that it is enabling and allowing for law enforcement to not, you know, buy to what we had considered you know, the governing laws where you have to seek a subpoena or warrant to find information. And that's something that is, as the trial is going on has become to question. Now, the defense is not able to bring up to full bear a lot of the details upon, upon the nature of how the FBI and the Department of Defense was able to find the tour servers to be able to find um, the different information associated with Silk Road. But on, on an outsider perspective where individuals are not governed by what is legal permissible to be placed on trial or not, it, it does give people a lot of pause because basically what it's saying is that the, the federal government has a right to just go into anybody's business without any warrants or any regard, whether or not they're conducting a, a legal or illegal activity or not. The other concern about the legal precedent, and just so we can clarify what legal precedent is, is a legal case establishing a principle or rule that a court or other judicial bodies adopts when deciding later cases with similar issues or facts based upon earlier trial results. So if a legal precedent is established or set that the federal government can, without the use of subpoenas or warrants, obtain servers and information in the manner in which they did with the Silk Road trial, uh, that means it can be done in other cases and be legally binding and admissible. But the other legal precedent, and I spoke about it in the first issue, is if an individual were to create a website, as in the case of Ross Ulbrich, and it was used in an illicit manner, as Silk Road was done, then then other websites out there could potentially face criminal action. And I kind of touched on it a little bit in the first episode of this trilogy about how Craigslist, and if you were to seek out and find, going through Craigslist, you can find prostitutes on Craigslist listing out their um, their type of services if you know if you know where to look and understand the varying code words. And then Craigslist could be responsible for uh, 
prostitution. They can be nailed for the uh, eBay. If you know where to look on eBay, there's different types of you know goods and services that come are questionable. But the fact that on eBay, a lot of stolen goods are sold on eBay. And even though eBay does cooperate with law enforcement when uh, stolen items are identified, uh, law enforcement can just turn around and say, well, that's not good enough. You should you should have a stronger verification put, put, in, put in place. And eBay does. I mean, you have to put up the vendor the vending number on some cases for certain items, pictures and stuff like that. If they count in good standing, but still stolen items are sold. eBay could, in fact, be considered, I guess, what is it? Was a fencing or any uh, to be a fence? The eBay could be charged for that, um, and, and in that case, what it will do with a lot of these different type of uh, websites is they will seek a, a stronger identification. <sighs> To use the site, so instead of something being free, you would have to pay a certain fee level associated to be to list your goods and services. They may not um, allow certain goods and services just because they don't want the legal hassle to be listed on their site, and so it could, in essence. Uh, cause a hardening of different websites and in an essence force people to seek alternative means to sell their goods and wares. I mean, are they going to go deeper into the dark net? No. But what they'll do is they, they'll go on Facebook and then Facebook goes, well, no, you can't list anything for sale on our website because we don't want to be associated with stolen goods or misrepresented misrepresented products. For example, um, I think, what was it? The foot company that has those shoes that are shaped like your foot. It's like feet with the little toes. They got slammed for uh, misrepresenting their product. Well, if someone were to or that company were to have be on Facebook and talking about their company, maybe Facebook could face uh, concerns because this company is, you know, putting up a false product. So Facebook could be sued because they didn't verify that the company is within compliance with the law, with the FDA and with uh, truth and advertising. And so this is what the legal precedent of Ross Ulbrich uh, case could do. Now, some will argue, well, Ross Ulbrich intentionally established a website for the sole purpose of selling uh, narcotics and illegal goods. And this wouldn't apply to companies that don't have that intent. But that's just not how the law works. Um, when a legal precedent like this is set, it could be applied whether your intent was for good or for bad. It's basically establishing that Ross Ulbrich established a website for, this whole, for and use it to sell to sell narcotics end of story I mean he just established a website to do that it doesn't matter if he intended to sell illegal goods or not the, the legal precedent is set and so there's a certain liability that could be placed upon a number of different websites a number of different companies out there but also is establishing what was happening within the last few years of the aggressive action that the federal government is going after different types of companies um, public companies in their effort against the war on drugs for example um, and I'm reading this article from Bloomberg that goes back to July of last year. Uh, as part of a crackdown on prescription drug abuse, um, UPS agreed last year to forfeit $40 million in payments for illicit online pharmacies under a non-prosecution agreement with the U.S. Justice Department. Walgreens and CVS had paid a total of more than $150 million in civil fines or claims that they sold medication knowing they weren't for legitimate medical uses. So we've all seen them. There's a number of different online pharmacies out there. Many of them are legitimate. Some are not. And they sell prescription drugs and they utilize, you know, UPS, FedEx and various agencies to, to ship these goods and services. And the U.S. government is basically saying that UPS and, the, and FedEx um, are complicit in this, that they should not, that they should somehow know what the goods are within their customers' packages. Now, FedEx uh, currently right now is, is fighting this. Um, and if they're convicted, they could be facing up to eight, $820 million in fines as a con- co-conspirator in the selling of prescription drugs. And that's just just prescription drugs. This is not has, has nothing as not at this point in time. Uh, these companies have not been charged with the illicit drug angle, which a number of these UPS and FedEx and even the Postal Service was used by vendors and customers 
dollars for the selling of for the selling and receiving of the the products from Silk Road Market. But basically, what um, FedEx is stating and their contention is, it's that uh, yes, they delivered these the, these goods, but basically they're not responsible for the contents of their packages, and they should not be opening up their customers' packages. They don't want to violate their privacy, and this could dramatically affect uh, the shipping market because once again, you know, the federal government is so concerned about illicit activity that they're finding everyone guilty on this and that they want FedEx and UPS and any other type of, of shipping services do basically what the U.S. Postal Service already does and look into people's packages at any point in time, regardless if it's if they have the legal authority to do so or not. So this is just a weirdness that I, I don't know where this is coming from. If this is just the fear because of the changing of the attitudes of the American public when it comes to illegal drugs and then in the eventual decriminalization of narcotics in itself and thus a number of different federal agencies will well there should no longer exist i mean why do you have the dea if you're no longer going to be enforcing that particular set of laws uh so it's just weird it's just overall this this trial in itself is very weird in the aggressive nature of the federal government going after ross elbridge i mean i've never seen within such a short short span of time when a certain kind of criminal meme or criminal element that the government is so quick to pounce on it i just um when you hear about different type of criminal activities it takes like sometimes decades or years for them to for law enforcement to even either if they if not become aware but to build a case and for them to do so in such a short span of time is very distressing for me as an individual and then there's another little side note is that the the federal government even though he is not charged with this and brings this up in the case in the sense that the type of materials that were made available on his site and one of them is bomb making materials so there was information for people to if they went on to Silk Road they could have access to information on how to make bombs, on how to fabricate different types of weapons. Now, that information in and of itself is not illegal. You can post how to make a bomb or how to make a pipe bomb or how to make a make C4. Uh, what is illegal is the is advocating to use that pipe bomb that you've made to kill someone. That's the illegal part. But the actual information itself on how to make a pipe bomb, whether someone agrees or not, whether or not someone should possess that information is protected under freedom of speech. But the federal government is using the fact that that type of material and other types of materials of that similar in nature was actively traded and sold on his websites and on the Silk Road website website as a means of demonstrating that he's a criminal element and a bad element. So that is a point of concern a little bit. So I'm going to leave it leave it here for the moment. Uh, the Ross Ulbrich case is ongoing. It's been going on for about a week now. It's in its second week. It's supposed to last for a total of six weeks. Um, there will be some updates within my news section on the case if there's any major revelations. But until the trial in itself is ended and whether or not Ross Ulbrich is going to be convicted or not, uh, I will update on, on the Silk Road trial. But given the fact that he is in federal court, just my personal opinion and that the conviction rate of the federal government is like 90 percent it things don't look for good for ross Ulbrich. whether or not he's going to be convicted of all the charges remains to be seen but i don't foresee himself being made free personally just my personal opinion i think he's going to be convicted of something but if you're still interested in following the silk road case um on our bitcoin on the reddit they are keeping track of the Ross Ulbrich case by ordering the actual Silk Road transcripts that are made available to the public the following day. Uh, the, there's a pool of money that's being pulled together to pay for the transcripts. It's literally like $250 a, a day for each transcript because you're paying per page, which in the day of the internet seems quite ridiculous for that information. You have to pay for that information, but that is being made available and uh, through our our, our Bitcoin and you can find the actual day-to-day -day transcripts if you want to look at the tr at the trial itself. But in general, that's just it for this episode. The music for the show was found off of freemusicarchive.org. The songs used in the background for the main story were, were Gaslight Anthem, American Slang, The Henry Clay People, End of the Empire, Fits in the, the Tantum's Money Grabber, Drive-By Truckers, Used to Be a Cop, and Dr. Dog, 
Nobody knows who you are. Thank you for listening to my show. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.